This is a Talk Station original podcast. On this week's episode of the Paper Boys podcast, JJ and I interview WRAL legend Jeff Gravely. He tells us about his 31 years as a Triangle sports reporter, his new role at NC State, and his love of Carteret County. It all starts right now on the Paper Boys podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Paper Boys Podcast. I'm JJ Smith. And I'm Zach Nally. We're reporters with the Cardiff County News Times. We're joined by someone this week who's also dabbled his toe in sports, journal- sports journalism just, just a bit. It's Mr. Jeff Gravely. Thanks for being with us. Good to be down at the coast, even though I'm not at the coast. You know what I mean. Good to be with you guys. Jeff, Jeff, like I said, he, he's uh, seen a thing or two. He's done a thing or two in the sports world. He was 31 years at WRAL in Raleigh. He was twice named the North Carolina Sportscaster of the Year by the North Carolina Sports Writers and Sportscasters Association. He won seven Emmys and just did a couple little things like cover 31 ACC tournaments, 20 Final Fours, five U.S. Open Golf Championships, a pair of Super Bowls, uh, the Rio Olympics in 2016, and a, and a partridge in a pear tree. Uh, you you had, a pretty solid, <laughs> had a pretty solid career there, didn't you, Mr. Gravely? It was amazing. It took me to places that I never would have imagined I would have gone growing up in a small town here in North Carolina, uh, just 40 miles north of Raleigh and Oxford. And, you know, we didn't do a lot of traveling when I was growing up. But, boy, I sure made up for it in my career. I've seen some wonderful places, met some incredible people, and been able to witness some memorable moments in the world of sports on so many different aspects. Well, well, let's start where all stories do at the beginning. When you're, you go to Webb High School, is that right? That's correct, yep. And uh, played sports? I did. I, was, I played uh, football, basketball, baseball, and track. So uh, I did four. Uh, I really thought I was going to play football in college. I, I wanted to be a college quarterback. Unfortunately, I was not very fast. had a decent arm, but not very fast. So my football career ended – before it ever began in college. But I was able to play baseball in college. I actually went to East Carolina my freshman year, tried out there, didn't make it. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to change, uh, change my opportunity. So I transferred to NC State and tried out there as a walk-on and, and made it and was able to uh, be on the team for Coach Sam Esposito. And I tell people all the time I was a pitcher. I never gave up a run, never gave up a hit, because I never played. All I did was throw batting practice, but I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. You had a perfect... To, I did. Perfect ERA, huh? never. That's right. Zero, zero, zero ERA. And the, I don't have to tell them the full story, but they eventually figure it out. So you're, you're in college, and it hits you at some point, I guess. I'm not going to... I'm not going to be signing autographs for anybody any day. For, uh, so wh- where does it turn to maybe sports journalism would be a cool career for me? Well, it's interesting because uh, after the fall baseball uh, practice that we had, after it was in my junior year, uh, got one of those notes on the old locker room, which they don't do anymore. You probably get it by text. But it was the old, please see Coach Tanner in his office. And I'm like, oh, boy. So we had just finished fall practice in in December, and uh, he called me in. He said, hey, you know, we appreciate everything you've done. Uh, You've lost weight. You've thrown batting practice when we needed you to. You've been a great teammate. But we really think you probably ought to start concentrating on your career and what you want to do. And I I, I was sitting there. I was trying to decipher what he was. I said, am I being cut? He goes, (laughs) yeah, this is a nice way of saying you're being cut. And so it was like – a month after that, I went across the street to WRL and, and tried to get an internship and ended up getting one in the spring. So I always used to tease and credit Coach Esposito and Coach Ray Tanner that they were the ones that started my TV career because they were the ones that cut me and made me start concentrating on what I wanted to do for my career. They, they told you to take your talents elsewhere, huh? That's exactly right. <laughs> yes, yes. That's so, exactly what they did. So you just kind of fell into it then, huh? I did, and you know, first off, I I never had dreams of going on the air. I always loved the photography and the editing, and that's how I started out uh, as an intern, and then went to be a uh, news photographer and then a sports photographer at WRAL. And um, you know, I, I just love shooting games. I love shooting stories and editing, and that's where you know 
to me, the real storytelling is for television. It's a visual medium, so you got to have the pictures, and you got to you got to edit and do all of that. And so that's where I, I enjoyed that. But then an opportunity came about for me to do some reporting, and I did. And then it just eventually grew about a decade later, where I got an opportunity to sit on the anchor desk. And let me tell you, I, I was awful when it when it first began sitting on the anchor desk. It was. It, I wasn't as bad as Boom Goes the Dynamite, but it was pretty bad. <laughs> and, you know, they, the one general manager said, you'll never go on the air here at WREL. Wow. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I took it as a challenge. And so what I ended up having to do is I had to take voice lessons to try to get rid of uh, a really syrupy southern accent. I still have a southern accent, but it's not as syrupy as it was when I was first starting coming from a small town. And so I did, I took voice lessons over at NC state and, and that helped me immensely. And wow. finally I got an opportunity to sit on the anchor desk and uh, just try to keep improving as much as possible and connecting with an audience. Well, you mentioned it a few seconds ago that, you know, when you first started on, you, you didn't get to jump right into sports. Everybody loves to work in sports, but you had to kind of pay your dues there for a bit and, and work as a news photographer. Yeah. What did, did that help ease the process in, or did that teach you some things when you first came in? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sh- shooting news is so different than shooting sports. I mean, news, uh, I mean, you're going to car wrecks, house fires, murder scenes, and, you know, board of directors meetings and school board meetings. And the, the thing that I had a hard time with is I, I always brought the bad stuff home. I, I couldn't shake the images of being at a car wreck or a train wreck or a, or a house fire and seeing how it affected people. That bothered me a lot. And I was like, I, I can't do this part. I just got very fort- lucky that the guy that was a sports photographer became the chief photographer. And I just kind of slid in right behind him and was given an opportunity to shoot sports full time. And so it was, it was one of those timing things. You know, we, we always hear that you got, sometimes you got to be lucky. And, and that was certainly a situation for me from a timing standpoint that I was able to do that and fill that role and, and jump right into the sports department full time. But the reason why I took the job as a news photographer, I actually sent a tape, a resume tape, uh, after my internship. I sent it down to Lee Moore at WCTI in New Bern and applied for a job there in sports. And, oh, wow. and I didn't get it. Wow. What's funny, what's funny is last week at the David Thompson statue unveil, which I emceed, Lee Moore was there. How about and that? And I, I was so great to see him. I had, I, we used to stay uh, in contact when I was working at REL, and he was still at, in New Bern, and we used to joke about it. And I said, yeah, and, I, and so I was standing there last week, and I reminded him, I was telling Derek Wittenberg, I said, yeah, here's the guy right here that didn't hire me in, in New Bern. And <laughs> Wittenberg just started laughing, and Lee did. And I, it was, it's, it's a long-running joke, but that's just a, that's a part of my story. Um, yeah. You know, one door closes, another one opens, and you just try to continue to kick down doors until you reach where you want to reach. You could have been our Brian North. Exactly. (laughs) Brian's all over the place, man. That dude, he he works his rear end off. (laughs) Doesn't he, though? He is all over the place. He does. Yeah. I admire that guy a lot. Well, I don't blame you for wanting to be in sports. That's one of the things we enjoy about working in it is it's mostly positive. I mean, you you got losses, you've got occasional controversies, but for the most part, uh, you know, compared to news, it is, it is pretty solid. Now I'm curious when you were growing up, did you have any influences in, in, in broadcasting or sports journalism or were there guys you looked up to when you were first getting started? You know, I, I, I grew up uh, watching WREL and watching their sports cast. I watched, uh, Nick Pond and Rich Brenner and then Tom Suter and then to get to work with Tom was was a huge honor for me. So, um, and I would watch games and kind of listen to the broadcast of the games. I would watch a lot of pregame shows and I still watch a lot of pregame and postgame shows to to watch how people react to something that just immediately happened. You have no script for it. You got to tell us succinctly and you know, intuitively what just happened in a short amount of time. And I always, that's why I love watching college game day today. Uh, just now, even though I'm not in TV anymore, I just admire the way they're able to handle so many situations that are unscripted. And, you know, so I would, I would watch a lot of uh, people that would interview people. I would watch the Merv Griffin show. I would watch the Johnny Carson show. And then later on, I would watch the Dave Letterman show. So, 
I watch people doing interviews because to me, there is an art to doing an interview. Um, a lot of good answers come from really good questions and thought out questions, not long and assumptive, but a good question can really generate a really good answer. And so I studied a lot of people and how they interviewed to try to put the person they're interviewing at ease to where it just becomes a conversation. And that's when you really get your best content. And what a, what a rare thing, so unique, to, to end up at the place where you grew up your entire life watching. I don't imagine that ha happens very often. No, and I, sorry, it's my dog. <laughs> That's all right. No, it doesn't happen very often. And, it, you know, it, it's one of those things where I, I used to tease Tom. I said, Tom, I grew up watching you. And he's like, don't say that. You make me sound old. And I'm like, no, I'm just paying homage to you, man. It's just one of those situations where I was just honored to get an opportunity to, to work and be with Tom and learn so much from Tom. And so it, it was a surreal situation for me to be able to do that and not only work with Tom, but also Charlie Gaddy, who was the news anchor at REL when I was working there and before and the weather people. And so it was just a great situation for me to walk into a place that I grew up watching and I was in awe for the longest time. Am I really here? Do I really get an opportunity to work here? And I did. It was fascinating. And those were big shoes you filled. You took over for Tom, right? Woo! Yes, let me tell you. That's, that's you know, you, you see it a lot in sports. Uh, like, how are you going to replace this guy? Or how are you going to replace that player? And it just happened that I tried to do the same thing with Tom. And it's not an easy thing, but you just have to be yourself. And that's the, that's the whole thing is you have to just be yourself and do be you and don't try to be someone else. But I did. I learned so much from Tom. That I just I didn't want to mess things up. He handed me the baton, and I just wanted to continue to run the race that he and so many before him had really set a precedent in at WRAL. Well, we're talking about Tom Suter, the face of Football Friday at WRAL for oh, I don't know how many years. You could tell us, Jeff, and then you you know you started getting in that job. And what, the, I always marvel at the local guys. We mentioned Brian North earlier, and putting that mm -hmm. thing together on a Friday night, Every, people. <clears throat> Without with with cameras all over the eastern part of the state, and you're in your case in the triangle, and running into this game and that game, and all coming together and editing and throwing that together at the last second. Tell us about that high wire act of putting together Football Friday. It's like being in a game. You have the adrenaline, you have the preparation, you have the execution, you have your playbook. You have this doesn't work, so we got to try this, or or this unpredictable thing happens, so how are we going to react? <clears throat> it is one of those adrenaline rushes that you get throughout and it was the closest thing that I felt to being in competition again as an athlete because of the so many variables of sending people out to games and you know you got to deal with rain you got to deal with um, lightning delays oh you I can't tell you how many times when I was even shooting football Friday and then when I was hosting so you'd send a photographer to two games sometimes three and you would try to predict, okay, which one do you want to go to first, what makes geographical sense, and which game do you think would probably be a blowout where you can go there, get some early highlights, and then move on. Can't tell you how many times we would say, all right, we're going to go to game X because I think this team is going to get ahead of them, and then we can swing over to Y. And it's total opposite. Nothing happens to the first game, and then by the time you get to the second game, they've scored all the points and the subs are in. And so you get nothing from two games, and – that's just the frustrating things that you have to do. But for the most part, it was an opportunity to showcase not individuals, but a team and a community. And that was the thing that was so beautiful that I thought was we would go to these small towns where the only time the news or a newspaper reporter was there is if something bad was happening. And we were able to go in these small communities and – show something positive that was going on on Friday night, and that was high school football. It was one of the most rewarding things that I ever worked on, and to this day is one of the career moments when you get an opportunity to cover you know, kids when they become high school players and then some go on to play in college and then some of them go on to play in the professional ranks, and they always come back and say, hey, I remember when you came out to our high school on a Friday night or I had a gentleman last night at the basketball game uh, at NC State's basketball game, says, hey, you may not know me, but he introduced himself. He goes, you presented me with the Extra Effort Award six years ago. And I'm like, that's just pretty awesome that they still remember that. And 
you know, I'm, I'm glad we were able to provide some positive coverage to a lot of communities and a lot of players over the years. It's funny you say that because no matter how often you hear sports reporters tell their stories of coming up through the ranks of covering prep sports, going up to college, and they eventually cover pros maybe, oftentimes they'll say some of their fondest memories are those, those Friday night lights. No doubt. Um, one of the, you know, career years that I remember is 1987 when little town of Garner, North Carolina, went undefeated and won the state football championship. They had a running back. His name was Anthony Barber. Set the, the national record for 48 touchdowns in a season. Went on to play at NC State. But they were a small, small town team that had to go to Charlotte and play West Charlotte. And West Charlotte was a dominant team. And they had talked so much trash all week, even their coach. And, and as the Garner coach said, we were just a bunch of country bumpkins that went to the queen city of Charlotte and took care of business. That just I don't, I'll never forget that year. It was just one of those magical years to be a part of. Who's Jeff, who's the first person you interviewed that you remember? I, I, I can't believe this is my job. Uh, oh, I can tell you one of my first live interviews that I did um, was at, the, at a Durham Bulls baseball game. And I was so bad. But the person that I interviewed was the manager named Grady Little. If the name sounds familiar, he went on and became uh, the manager of the Boston Red Sox. Sure. And so Grady, Grady was a great guy. And he came on live with me. And uh, a few years later, he let me dress out and do a kind of a series of life as a minor leaguer. And ironically, the uh, road trip that we took was to Kinston. So I got to dress out as a Durham Bull and participate and throw BP in, in Kinston, and I'll never forget it. And every time I drive by on my way to the beach and see Granger Stadium, I think that's still the name of it. Oh, uh, wow. It just brings back a lot of memories. So, yeah, Grady Little was my first live interview. As far as my first interview where I went, wow, I think the first one I ever did, I was like, holy cow, this is pretty awesome to get an opportunity to talk to any sports figure, much less – some of the more famous ones that I had an opportunity to sit across from. Right. Well, who did you naturally become closest to of all the people you covered, either because you just covered them for so long or they were just so easy to get along with? I think the other thing, too, is people wonder, well, how do you go to a school like State and go cover North Carolina and Duke and all that? But what you find out and what you learn is you don't cover teams for the school. You cover teams for the individuals that take part in it. Absolutely. And that's coaches, administrators, players. You don't see the jersey. You don't see the school. You see the people. And that's where I became – that's when I really started to enjoy my job. And one of the first uh, areas of that, that really hit me was in 1985 and 86 when I was first starting to work there. That's when Duke basketball was really good for the first time under Coach K. As a matter of fact, in 86 – they played for the national championship, losing to Louisville. But the senior class they had was really the cornerstone of the Duke basketball program when they committed to play at Duke when Duke was not Duke. And they bought into Coach K. Jay Billis was one of them. And I, I remain good friends with Jay. Um, Johnny Dawkins was one. Mark Allery was one. David Henderson was one. Uh, Tommy Amaker was one. So these are guys that you find out my goodness, these are wonderful people. I didn't care where they went to school. Same thing happened at North Carolina with guys like George Lynch and Eric Montross and, um, you know, just so many of those guys, Donald Williams, and then you start to cover the national championships and you see the fight that Roy Williams has to try to win that first national championship and to have an opportunity to cover that was quite an honor. So I got to cover Coach K's first national championship, Roy's first national championship, and Dean Smith's last national championship. Wow. And I just can't tell you how in awe I was of all of those situations and to be in school at NC State in 1983 when Coach Valvano led the Wolfpack um, to the national championship. I've been blessed with so many of those opportunities to witness history made in college basketball on Tobacco Road. Yeah, Jeff, that's what I've always told people. People are like, who do you root for? Who do you root for? You root for this school? You root for that school? And I'm like, I root for people and I root for stories. Bingo. Yeah. Could not agree more. Couldn't have said it better myself. And that's the absolute truth. And that's, uh, that's been my kind of 
my MO from when I first started. Because when I was at, in school at State studying communication, the one thing they told us and taught to us is when you become a journalist and work in the media, your objectivity is imperative. You need to be fair, you need to be balanced, and you need to be objective. And I think it's hard for some people to do that. And we see more and more of that now, particularly not just in sports, but in, in other news angles as well. And then there's the perceived bias that a lot of people think they know about you, but really don't. And that's the part that you can't control. You just try to do the best you can by continuing to tell good stories, be as fair and balanced as you can, and let people formulate their opinions ever how they're going to want to formulate them because you're not going to change their mind. Having said that, I'm sure uh, in, in a triangle where there's uh, three major programs that uh, you were probably accused of being a favoritism, showing favoritism to all three at some point, right? Look, there's no doubt about it. I mean, there was one period uh, there <clears throat> over a two years <clears throat> span where I was accused and of having I, I, they told me I graduated from state and then I was told I graduated from Carolina and then I said, oh, he's a Duke grad. So I have three degrees based on the opinion of, of the court of public opinion, even though I don't. So I kind of thought, I kind of laughed at it. I'm like, okay, well, I must be doing my job okay if, if that's the situation. Yeah, we kind of do the same thing here. It's obviously in the high school level, but <laughs> we get all different, you know, oh, you're a, you guys prefer this school, you guys prefer that school. and Right. You, know, you don't it, like our school. You're never here. That's right. You that's only right. report <laughs> negative things. You only report when we lose. And, right. and as long as all get, three think that, then we're doing good. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll tell you one sad part about doing high school football and doing football Friday is we actually would get people that would call and leave um, leave uh, messages on the answering machine. And if there are a lot of people out there that don't know what an answering machine is, <laughs> but basically it's, it's voicemail. The, it's the old voicemail. <laughs> but people would call us and say, you know, why didn't you show my son? He had five touchdowns. And I'd try to explain, you know, we were only there in the second half. He scored them in the first. And then there were some parents or the people say, you're costing my kid a scholarship. Oh, yeah. You're not showing him on TV. It's a, Look, no, 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 no. If your son or daughter is good enough, they will earn a scholarship right. based on a coach's evaluation, not how many times they're shown on football Friday. But, it, you know, that's the, that's the part that kind of got old. And, and, you know, you just couldn't convince those people that, hey, no, we're here to help you. We're trying to do all that we can with as limited as resources that we have, we can't staff every football game from start to finish. You just can't do that. Yeah, 31 years at WRAL, 35 years overall. You mentioned answering machines just then. Tell us about how the job changed <laughs> from day one to the day you, to the day you, you hung up your, your hung up your anchor mic. It's been crazy. Cause I, somebody sent me a few pictures about six months ago when I was shooting uh, down in Daytona, the Daytona 500. And I had the old camera, I had the camera on the right shoulder. It had an umbilical cord to a tape deck that was on my left shoulder that we used to carry around to record on three-quarter inch tapes. And then it becomes beta tapes or M2 tapes. And then it becomes a disc. And now it's a card. And, you know, before we used to have to drive these satellite trucks all over the place, vans to be live. Now it's a backpack uh, with... with uh, the ability to go live through a backpack and technology has changed and how you're able to transmit stories back now. I mean, there've been many, a football Friday story edited and written and sent back from a waffle house anywhere with good Wi-Fi. <laughs> and, and, and if you were covering, if you cover the, the same team enough, you knew which stores to go to at 10 and 11 o'clock at night that would still be open that had good Wi-Fi. That's part of your recon mission when you go and cover them is where can i get good uh wi-fi service from to feed stuff back but before sure. you, had, you had to take trucks everywhere or you had to drive back to the station to get everything on and that, that's resulted in several traffic violations i'll say <laughs> uh trying to get back and make deadlines well, and talking about a difference between Carter County and Raleigh, you know, Zach and I are, are hoofing it to ball games, and <laughs> old Jeff, he was going around in Sky Five, the Sky Five, the helicopter <laughs> to ball game. Tell us about dropping in on some high school football Friday games on in a helicopter. Yeah, that was that was phenomenal. We had the Sky Five games of the week, so we would double up games, or sometimes we would do three games in the helicopter, and. 
We would. We, we would plan it all out. Okay, we would have to call the school because you're not going to land a helicopter on the football field. <laughs> What we'd have to do is find an auxiliary field near it that had enough light that we could land. So it would be a baseball field or it could be a, a soccer field or somewhere near. But it never failed. People knew the helicopter was going to come, and they'd start to hear that thing come over the, over the horizon. And then we would fly over it and shoot some aerials. And there would be players that would just be looking up in the sky. Sure. They were, were supposed to be in the huddle. There were officials that were looking up in the sky. There were people in the stands waving. And then we would land, and then we would go in and shoot a little bit, and they would go back out and hop in and go to another destination and do the same thing all over, and then we would fly back to the station and, and edit it all together. Yes. But that was pretty wild to get to do that. And we used to do that when we presented the Extra Effort Award because when Tom presented the Extra Effort Award, he also anchored the 6 o'clock news that day. So – we would, we would fly the helicopter, and, and a lot of times we would land on the 50-yard line with a pep rally going on, and Tom gets out of the helicopter and presents the award. So it was quite a, quite a scene when we would show up in a helicopter. It was not, not – no way to slip in unnoticed when you're flying in on a helicopter. Well, one of the things we enjoy about this job is, you know, these you get to and you, you you end up feeling this way as well as the journalists. These kids feel important when you're out there covering them, and you enjoy getting to make yeah. them feel important. And if I was a high school football player, <laughs> I don't think there'd be anything that would make me feel more important than a what looks like a presidential entry here, a helicopter dropping down, and here comes Jeff running over with his camera. Uh, that's about as as good as it gets yeah. playing North Carolina high school football. Uh-huh. It, it was, man. It was. It, it brought it to a, a different level. That was college game day before there was college game no day. No doubt. In an abbreviated uh, in-flight form. Uh, I, I can remember another time we were talking about driving trucks uh, to destinations. This was 1986, and Bob Holiday and I went to a Husky to cover a high school game in a Husky, and they were playing Fuquay Verena, and it had rained Oh, my goodness, it had rained. We just knew they were going to cancel the game, but they did not think that. So we drove all the way to Ohotsky, and we had a satellite truck with us. And about the second quarter, quarterback from Fuquay rolls to the right, and he throws the football, and I lift my camera up to follow the ball, and the free safety comes, never sees me, and just bowls me over, oh. knocks my camera off oh. my shoulder. It's in the mud. Oh, my gosh, the camera's dead. We, we can't do the game. So we had to take what we had in the first quarter and a half and try to make a story in it. Uh, and meanwhile, my camera is just dead. It's sitting over there, and at least it, it kept rolling. So when you see the actual part, and we actually showed it on the air, you see the ball go up, and then you hear, oh, no, boom, and you see the camera hit the ground, <laughs> and then it turns, turns, the video turns green, and then it just stops. And so that's, that's another one of the – the hazards of covering high school football or any football or any sport is getting run over. And that was the worst that I ever got plowed over at a football game was that one. Have you ever gotten plowed over, JJ? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I, it was my first season. <laughs> I, it's, it's a rite of passage. For it's sure. got to happen at some point. Absolutely. Um, talk about another. And when it happens, and when it happens, you you want to be real cool about it. You do. You try to play it off. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. It's all good. And inside your leg, I I got plowed up right in my legs, and I just had to pretend like it didn't hurt, and it was awful. Inside your inside your dying. Everybody's looking at you. So so that leads me to another story. We had a news photographer that would go out and cover some down east games for us, and he went down uh, one Friday night, and he called Tom. He said, Tom. I got run over, and I think I broke my leg. Oh. I've got to go to the emergency Holy room. Tom cow. goes, Tom goes, what, did you get any touchdowns? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, <laughs> wow. He's like, uh, yeah, but I got to go to the hospital. I think I broke my leg, and sure enough, he had. He had broken wow. his leg. Wow. <laughs> and that was before the days where you could just feed back on Wi-Fi, so that game didn't make it that night because oh, he broke his leg. <laughs> Uh, talk, talk about another huge difference. We've been talking a lot about high school sports, but, man, you, you start out at WRAL, and we've got this fledgling NBA team down in, in Charlotte, and before you know it, we've got three professional teams in North Carolina with the Panthers coming along and then the Hurricanes right there in your backyard. Well, what, how did that mm-hmm. uh, go over? You know, you, you're covering high school and college, and all of a sudden it's, North Carolina is a pro state. Exactly. And, you know, I covered uh, the Hornets' first NBA game in 1988. Wow. And – um, at 
the time, my wife was also working at WREL as a news photographer. Um, we weren't married at the time. Uh, but she also covered first game in Charlotte with, went with me, but she wasn't my photographer. Her reporter was Stuart Scott. Oh, used wow. used to work at WREL. Wow. Yep. So, you know, we, we remained close with Stu. Uh, he was such a great guy. He was a news reporter at WREL. We didn't have room for him in sports, believe it or not. And so after he had a short stint as a news reporter at REL, he got a sports job in Orlando. And from there, he joined ESPN. But no matter how popular he got, he always came back to Raleigh, came through REL, always came to visit us. And, you know, it's interesting when you start telling stories, one thing leads to another. So you start you bring up the Hornets, and I immediately think of 88 going to the first game when they played the Cleveland Cavaliers, and, and then that led me to the opportunity to, to befriend Stuart Scott and get to know him. And that, That's the beautiful part of a, a, of a journey when you have a career is when the wonderful people that you get to meet and come across and some remain your friends forever. And that's a beautiful thing that you can have. As, as rewarding as it is to – win awards or this, that, and the other. To me, the people that you generate personal relationships with, that that will last forever, and that's what I cherish the most from my career in, in broadcasting. And some become your wife. That's exactly right. <laughs> yep. Now, J.J., you know yep, about that, <laughs> I think, as well. I don't know if you know this, Jeff. J.J. also met his wife uh, at his news business here at the Carter <laughs> County News Times. It seems yeah. to be a... Uh, a thing here. Uh, and then, you know what happens is because you, w- you usually work the same hours or right. at least sometimes have the same days off. That was the case with me and my, my wife now. Is we had Mondays and Tuesdays off. I mean, people had Mondays and Tuesdays off, you know, but that's when we would go play tennis. We would do uh, go out to eat or whatever, and then it just it just happened. And the thing was is there was um, an unwritten nepotism uh, clause at Capital Broadcasting that You could not date anyone at the station. And so we did that secretively for over a year and a half. Oh, wow. No one knew. No one knew. And finally, we made the decision. We were like, all right, this is crazy. We want to get married. We know we got to go to the general manager and talk to him and let him know that we're going to decide. And we had decided Mary was going to leave and I was going to stay. And so we go to the general manager and we're sitting there and, He's the one that told me I would never go on the air at REL. So then we're having this conversation uh, in 1988, th- three years later, and we're like, well, you know, we, we know you're, you're not supposed to be dating, and but we have been for the last year and a half, and, and now we're going to take the next step. We want to get married, and we know one of us has to leave. So Mary's going to leave, and, and Jeff is going to stay, but we just wanted to let you know. And he let us go through this whole rigmarole, which felt like an hour. It was probably about five minutes. And finally, he leans back in his chair and he goes, I don't have a problem if y'all are married working here. We're like, what? <laughs> You're kidding me. We're like, what? He goes, no, as long as one is not a manager over the other, I don't have a problem with it. Oh, wow. We're like, hallelujah, this is phenomenal. Well, it was about two months later that he hired his son. So there goes the nepotism law. Right oh, out. oh timing. We just got like, There's another example of Perfect timing working in your favor nice. at the most unexpected time. And, and then you and your wife produced this uh, volleyball star who becomes a coach in, <laughs> becomes a coach in Carter County. Yeah, yeah. Meg, she loves it down there. And you know, she's been involved with the, the volleyball team. She didn't do it this past year. She, her, her work with Mary Cheat and King has, uh, has increased each year as the company has grown, and they just reached out not only in real estate but in marketing or doing national stuff. And Meg just couldn't do it, but she just loves being down there and the people that are down there and you know the people that she's been able to meet at West Carteret, uh, working with Turner and all the coaches and all the people that she's been able to meet. She just loves it. And so I don't think we're going to get her back to Raleigh. I think she's down there for good. And you know what? That's not that's not a bad thing because eventually I'd love to end up down there by myself permanently at some point. For sure. How how were you able to balance the uh, family and work, Jeff? You know, being in sports, that's, that the, the schedule is not kind. It's not, and I'll tell you that that was the hardest thing. Is it takes so much of your time away from your family, and you have to really work at it to make it work. Like when Megan was in school. 
I worked, I worked nights all of my career, except now. And so when she was at school, she would go to bed before I came home, and then she would leave before I would wake up. Oh, wow. So the only time I would see her is basically when I would crack the door whenever I got home at like 1 or one thirty, and I would just check on her and see if she was okay and then close the door. But we had our weekends. Um, you know, sometimes I would have weekends off. Sometimes I would have one day of the weekend off, and that's why that was our time. I didn't do a lot of extra things on the weekend. I didn't play golf on the weekend. I didn't plan guy trips on the weekend because that was – our family time, and particularly with me and Megan, and yeah. it was, uh, it's hard, man, because you guys know how much time it takes. You know how much time it takes away. And if, uh, if you don't like working nights and weekends, I remind, I would advise you not to become a sports <laughs> journalist or a coach or whatever, because that's when you're going to work, man. That's, that's exactly when you're going to work. After 31 years, you call it quits. How, how did you know it was time? I think the, the whole broadcasting particularly in sports broadcasting, I think has changed a lot over the years. And it has nothing to do with ESPN. I think managers kept saying, well, why do we need local sports when they got ESPN? And, and I would always call bull on that because ESPN is not covering a market like your local TV stations are, particularly in sports. And I got to a point where I didn't think we were getting enough resources, time, or we were that important. And I just felt like I need to find another way to continue – to tell stories, to continue to work in athletics. And I was very fortunate. I just took a, a leap of faith, and I'm like, you know, I'm done in local broadcasting. Let me see if I can find something else. And so I, I spoke with someone at the ACC Network, at Duke, at North Carolina, and at NC State. And it was Boo Corgan at NC State who said, you know what, I like this idea. Because my point was, who's telling the story of your university? Who's helping to tell that story? through features, through interviews, through radio, through coaches' shows or whatever. I said, let me be a part of that. And Boo is a very – he doesn't just look directly in front of him. He's a very good visionary. He looks down the road at what he would like to see happen, and he was willing to give it a shot. And so he, he created a position, and it's called the Director of Content Strategy, and I still don't know what in the heck that means, but <laughs> – my mom was very impressed with the title <laughs> as a director. But basically, whatever they need me to do, if you need me to do features, shoot features, be on the radio shows, uh, help produce the coaches' shows, podcasts, write stuff, whatever you need me to do for NC State, for the university, for the Wolfpack Club, for Wolfpack Sports Property, I'm here and I'm available. And it's turned into a really rewarding job still continuing to tell stories and still continuing to get to know people uh, in athletics but also getting to know them on a little different level when you're kind of inside the ropes so to speak of an athletic department you get to to know a little bit more uh, of what's really going on and have conversations with people and go to practices when they're closed and, and you get to see and witness things from a totally different angle and that's been a, a very rewarding thing for me to continue to do what I've learned so much in the last 35 years, but to apply it to one university with 22 sports. You've been at NC State now for four years, which I'm sure probably blows your mind, uh, as you said, the director it's of content not. strategy. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about those four years and tell us about some of the stories you've really enjoyed working on. Well, it's been really rewarding. Um, I work around a lot of great coaches and, and, and athletes that are just wonderful. And even like, Last week, it was a really big moment for me, a kind of a full circle moment when I got to host and MC the statue unveiling of David Thompson. Mm. Now, David Thompson played at NC State in the early 70s, and I remember as a kid, a 10-year-old kid sitting on my bed watching a little 9-inch black-and-white TV with antennas sticking straight up and tinfoil on him to make sure I could watch the game, watching NC State go through and beat Maryland in triple overtime or UCLA in the NCAA semifinals and then beating Marquette for the national championship. So then, I mean, DT was my guy. I mean, that was my team. And to have an, an opportunity to host that event last week with him there, and I also got to do, uh, they wanted me to do the video that was going to be shown at the unveiling that basically said, who is David Thompson? And there were certain people they wanted me to try to interview. And 
I was able to interview them all and put together about an eight-minute story. Look, if I was at RAL or in local TV, you're not going to produce an eight-minute story. Mm. You're not going to have the time to do that. They're going to want that in the minute 30. You may get four minutes on a may, maybe, maybe, maybe. But that's a great thing about where I am now. I have the ability to tell long-form stories, longer forms. And so that was an eight-minute and three-second video. And some of the people that I interviewed, obviously David Thompson, I interviewed two of his teammates, Tom Burleson and Monty Tao. And then one week I flew to New York and interviewed Lynn Elmore, who played at Maryland in the 1974 season. And then the next week I flew to San Diego and interviewed Bill Walton in his house in San Diego. And Walton played against David Thompson and that NC State team in 1974. And I'm just like, this is amazing. These are career moments to get an opportunity to do that. So being able to do those kind of things now is just so rewarding and exciting for me. And then, like today, I'm on a conference call with some of the academic support people for student-athletes. We're getting ready to host the December graduation of the student-athletes on Friday afternoon, and I get to host that. Um, you know, I'm planning to go to the bowl game on the 27th. So I had so many other things and, and different things. I was in Dunn, North Carolina yesterday shooting at an Art 3 Gases place for one of our marketing videos that we were doing. So things, I'm, I'm still doing what I've been doing before. I'm just doing it in a different scope at, at a different place, but a place that I'm very familiar with. I mean, I, I grew up watching NC State. I was able to be there and go to school there. So a lot of things, um, I don't have to Google. I've lived it. And that's one of the things that's been so rewarding for me is to come back and continue to tell stories that I grew up with, but now tell them to a different generation. Yeah, you mentioned Dunn, and I think that's the first high school you went to go cover a, a, a football game, and here you are years you later. Have, still, you, have, you have researched that well, my friend. <laughs> and years later, here you are. You're still working in that area, and like you said, I mean, there's – the intimacy that you can create with a community like that and your ability to then tell their stories with context. Um, It only comes with understanding the history and the, and the community. And you certainly, you know, ingrained yourself in that area. Well, that's been one of the neat things is to be able to come back and tell some of the stories uh, that I got to live through. Like uh, this last basketball season, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the 83 team. And I got to sit down with all of them. And, you know, I was in school with those guys. And uh, it was just to do it again this year with the 74 guys. uh, You know, I kept telling them, you know, those were the guys that I went to Norm Sloan's basketball camp in 1976. And one of, one of the things I wanted to purchase was a a Jersey with state on it and get the numbers 44 put on. And so I did, and I found it. Two weeks ago, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to pull this out at the statue unveiling in front of everybody and just kind of help tell the story about how this was a team that I grew up watching. And I pulled that thing out, and everybody just started laughing So, because I was 13 when I got the jersey. And right now, I'm, it would never fit me in a million years. It's more the size of a pocket square than it is a jersey. But it was a really cool moment. And, I, you know, I got to – Go find an artifact that I still had in my attic and still use it today to help tell a story. And that was pretty cool because my wife challenged me. She goes, you're never going to find it. You don't still have that thing. I'm like, I do. So it was 30 minutes in the attic, and I walked down the steps, and I didn't utter a word. I just held the jersey up and shook my head and said, still got it. Nice. And even David Thompson appreciated that. He started laughing about it. So that was pretty cool. And for the kids out there, David Thompson is the ACC GOAT, so just look him up on YouTube and oh. you'll, you'll be impressed. I, I used the line at the induction or at the unveiling. I said he was the GOAT before there ever was the GOAT. There, there go. was no acronym GOAT when David Thompson <laughs> played. There was no social media. He couldn't dunk when he was in, in college because of NCAA rules. But can you imagine if a talent like him was playing in the current environment? Man, he would have blown up social media. Oh he would have been a favorite of so many people, but you're right. It, you do yourself a favor and go and look up some highlights of David Thompson, and you'll be awed at how good he was. Well, Carter County folks might not know Jeff Gravely by name, but I'm sure they probably know you by face. I'm sure they've seen you over the years in restaurants in Carter County, out of Shackleford. <laughs> Tell us how long you've been coming down to Carter County and how, and how you found us. 
Well, I'll tell you, I'm probably I'm married into it. Uh, my wife, uh, her family, her parents, and her grandparents uh, would always go to Atlantic Beach, Moorhead City. And so it's been a generational thing. Uh, her parents had a place down there uh, at first it was at Place of the Beach, and then they had a place at, uh, place of the, uh, at a eight and a half. And they had a boat down there, and that's when I really got hooked on boating. And, and I was like, you know what, maybe one day. I can't tell you how many times we would walk up and down the beach right there in front of Place of the Beach, Sea Spray, and uh, Triple S Pier, and, and like, God, wouldn't it be awesome to one day own something down here? And so that became a goal of ours. And, and we actually bought it probably a little earlier than we thought we would. But we wanted Megan, when she was in high school, to enjoy it, and we wanted to enjoy it because you're never guaranteed anything. I, I have so many friends, well, not so many, but I have several friends who had saved for retirement, and they never made it to retirement. And so I was like, I'm not going to do that. So we found a little place at Sea Spray, and we loved going down there, spending a little time, maybe a weekend, loved going down for a week, but we just enjoy the area. It is just a beautiful area. And so many things to do, so many options to, to go to if you've got a boat, and so many great places to eat, and so many wonderful people. So it's been a, a great community away from home that we've really become attached to. And, and now you're counting the days until you become a full-time resident. Ooh, I can't wait. That's our, <laughs> our goal. That's our goal. One, we're just trying to get to that point. When that is, I don't know. But we'll get there one day, hopefully. Well, what, what's the name of your boat, and what kind of fit? What's your favorite kind of fishing? I have a uh, twenty-one foot sea hunt, and the name of the boat is appropriately Sportscaster. Nice. So, I, I may not still be one, but I still have one, and it's my boat. There you I go. I love the fish. You know, I need to. I, I need to get back into fishing more. I do more cruising now than fishing, but I, I love any kind of fishing. We, we're more of the white meat. Enjoy, enjoy that. But you know, any kind of. Cheat Dad, Mary loves grouper. Uh, I love mahi. I think it's the prettiest fish in the water when you catch it and then you get to eat it. Marlin are great, but uh, don't have a boat size enough to go out there and chase those. So I'll just leave them in the water for now. And the rumor is you're a much better fisherman than a golfer, huh? You know what? I, I suck at both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, 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 it, they're very similar. Both can be very frustrating and can test your patience. And you can get out of practice real easy on both of them. But you know what? If you can somehow try to enjoy them in, the, in some way as opposed to being, uh, let it raise your level of blood pressure, then I think you can get a heck of a lot more out of it. I certainly did that uh, with golf, and I need to do the same with that in fishing. Jeff, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for joining us today. Guys, it's been great, and I appreciate your interest, and I appreciate you taking the time to ask some really great questions, and I hope people have been able to learn a little bit through our conversation.